here's what's coming up on today's Airborne. Boeing's fix for the 787 is approved. Grasshopper makes its highest leap yet. And Florida's fantasy of flight opens phase two of its Golden Hill project. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. Finally, progress. The FAA has approved the Boeing Commercial Airplane Company's certification plan for the redesigned 787 battery system. After thoroughly reviewing Boeing's proposed modifications and the company's plan to demonstrate that the system will meet FAA requirements. The certification plan is the first step in the process to evaluate the 787's return to flight and requires Boeing to conduct extensive testing and analysis to demonstrate compliance with the applicable safety regulations and special conditions. FAA engineers will be present for the testing and will be closely involved in all aspects of the process. The battery system improvements include a redesign of the internal battery components to minimize initiation of a short circuit within the battery, better insulation of the cells, and the addition of a new containment and venting system. The FAA also has approved limited test flights for two aircraft. These aircraft will have the prototype versions of the new containment system installed. The FAA will approve the redesign only if the company successfully completes all of the required tests and analysis to demonstrate the new design complies with FAA requirements. The FAA's January 16, 2013 Airworthiness Directive, which required operators to temporarily cease 787 operations, is still in effect. Florida's Treasure Coast has long been where fortune hunters went to seek untold riches. Now for the Sky Pirate and all of us, Florida's Fantasy of Flight has just opened Phase 2 of its Golden Hill project, revealing a 20,000 square foot treasure trove of rare and vintage aircraft, aircraft parts, and flight artifacts. The Golden Hill project is aptly named as a nod to Silver Hill the nickname for the Paul E. Garber Preservation, Restoration, and Storage Facility of the Smithsonian Institute's National Air and Space Museum in Sweetland, Maryland. Phase 1 of Golden Hill opened in the summer of 2012 with such a tremendous gas response that Fantasy of Flight decided to open its entire storage facility in January 2013. Among the residents of Golden Hill Phase 2, are the Awesome Amphibians, PBY, Catalina, and Grumman Duck. The carrier-based Conquerors, Fairy Swordfish, and Grumman Hellcat. The world's earliest jets, Gloucester Meter and De Havilland Vampire. And the War Changers, Mitsubishi Zero and Lockheed P-38 Lightning, as well as much more. This restricted area is accessible only by escort. Guests are loaded aboard the vintage open-air or Lampa Express trolley where they can enjoy views of the attraction. The planes on display on the tarmac and daily flights of vintage aircraft and finally Golden Hill. The new exhibit is included in admission to Fantasy of Flight. On Thursday, March 7, 2013, SpaceX's Grasshopper doubled its highest leap to date to rise 24 stories or 262.8 feet, hovering for approximately 34 seconds and landing safely using closed loop thrust factor and throttle control. Grasshopper touched down with its most accurate precision thus far on the centermost part of the launch pad. The test was completed at SpaceX's rocket development facility in McGregor, Texas. Grasshopper, SpaceX's vertical and takeoff and landing vehicle, continues SpaceX's work toward one of its key goals, developing fully and rapidly reusable rockets, a feat that will transform space exploration by radically reducing its cost. With Grasshopper, SpaceX engineers are testing the technology that would enable a launched rocket to land intact, rather than burning up upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. This was Grasshopper's fourth in a series of test flights, with each test demonstrating exponential increases in altitude. 
The NTSB has issued five safety alerts that focus on the most frequent types of general aviation accidents. Each year, about 475 pilots and passengers are killed, and hundreds more are seriously injured in GA accidents in the United States, which is why GA safety is on the NTSB's most wanted list. A safety alert is a brief information sheet that pinpoints a particular safety hazard and offers practical remedies to address the issue. The five safety alerts issued Tuesday are 1. Is your aircraft talking to you? Listen. 2. Reduce visual references. Require vigilance. 3. Avoid aerodynamic stalls at low altitude. 4. Mechanics. Manage risk to ensure safety. 5. Pilots manage risk to ensure safety. The NTSB is creating five short videos, one for each safety alert, which will be rolled out this spring. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since its inception, Redbird Flight Simulations has been dedicated to developing new training technologies and processes in an ongoing effort to make aviation safer, more affordable, and more accessible. Consider Redbird's flagship flight training device, the FMX, a superior quality, full motion, feature-rich advanced aviation training device priced with real-world flight training organizations in mind. With standard features that are anything but standard, such as wraparound visuals, a fully enclosed cockpit, quick change configurations, scenario-based training compatibility, and of course, an electric motion platform, the FMX serves up a level of realism that is simply unavailable in other training devices on the market. For more information on Redbird Flight Simulations, the Redbird FMX, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or podcast, drop us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. A vintage B-29 has been given a new lease on life thanks to a group of Wichita, Kansas business leaders who are determined to see the airplane restored to flying condition. A new nonprofit group, Doc's Friends, has taken ownership of the airplane and will support the effort to refurbish the vintage plane. It's believed that Doc is the last known Boeing B-29 Superfortress that is restorable to flying condition. DOC was originally built in Boeing's Wichita Plant 2 facility in 1944. During World War II, this airplane was one of a squadron of eight airplanes named for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. It was decommissioned in 1956 and spent 42 years in the desert before being rescued in 1998 and brought back to Wichita in 2000 by aviation enthusiast Tony Mazzolini and a host of dedicated volunteers. Mazzolini and the volunteers made great strides restoring the aircraft before efforts stalled due to poor economic conditions and available hangar space. Doc's Friends, a group of Wichita aviation enthusiasts, was recently formed to help make Mazzolini's dream of flying a museum come true. In a first for EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency has handed over a type certificate for the Airbus A400M to Airbus Military. This type certificate supersedes a restricted type certificate that was issued by EASA in April of 2012 for the same type. It follows a satisfactory completion of a functioning and reliability flight testing campaign of more than 300 hours, demonstrating the aircraft's compliance with civil airworthiness and environmental requirements. Handing over EASA type certificate to Airbus Military, Dr. Norbert Lowell, EASA Certification Director, said, quote, The A400M is the first turboprop airlifter in its category to receive EASA certification. I am very proud of this great achievement which is thanks to the dedication and teamwork of the EASA and Airbus military teams." End quote. This A400M civil aircraft configuration and EASA certification 
will be the baseline for a subsequent recommendation for the military version of the A400M. It's Friday and time for our barnstorming commentary. Today, Jim says don't be afraid to stand up for what you believe, even if you're standing alone. Thanks, Ashley, and hi, folks. Hope you're having a better week than we have had. It's been an interesting one, a difficult one, and in particular, Wednesday of this week was about one of the most unpleasant days that I've had in a long time. As I had to deal with the rudeness, the yelling, the provocation, the insults, and the threats from a lawyer representing Cirrus Aircraft. Um, from 9.30 in the morning to a little bit after 5.30 in the day, it was about as unpleasant and as weird an experience as any I can recall. As we may have told you in the, well, actually, we know we told you in the past, we have a problem with Cirrus Aircraft. We did a number of stories they didn't like. We stand by the stories. Nothing that's occurred since has proven any of those stories to be remotely untrue. And as a matter of fact, a lot of things that have occurred since certainly bolster and support the conclusions reached in those stories. We documented that the fact that uh, Cirrus was in the process of being sold to China, which they vehemently denied and lied to us about. Not only that, but they did it in recorded interviews that subsequently did not please them when we played those recorded interviews back again on the day the Cirrus uh, sale to China was announced. We have been threatened by them. We have been, they have attempted to intimidate. They have told us in no uncertain terms via their staff, their personnel, and other parties, including members of their legal staff, to shut up. They admit they owe us a lot of money, money they've withheld because they're attempting to damage us. But we'll be happy to talk to you about paying that when you shut up. Or, as, to put it more pre precisely in the, in the words of one lawyer, when you quit your critique. Folks, look, we're trying to do our best. Journalism, as you no doubt have seen if you check the airwaves, is in awful shape. And all I can practice is a brand that I believe in which says, tell the truth. It doesn't mean you go off willy-nilly and just, you know, slap everybody with every bad thing you can, or for that matter, that you just find the good things. But you tell the truth. You try to find a balance. And everything we've done for, with Cirrus, for instance, we called them or emailed them every time saying, hey, this is our story. What do you got to say? Of course, didn't get a response. We're doing our best. Uh, we're obviously in for a war. There is no question in anybody's mind that the current intent of Cirrus is to shut us up, if not destroy the company. Um, that has pretty much been said to us by a number of people by Cirrus and certainly through their actions and the way they've conducted this so-called legal uh, game. Uh, Dale Klapmeyer once said that we'll settle this. Well, they're not settling anything. The fact of the matter is, is that uh, they're playing games with the legal system. I don't like what I see, but I have to defend it regardless. So we've been kind of quiet about it for the last year, and that ends now. We will defend ourselves. We will do so as ethically, legally, and responsibly as we know how. We will do so with a great deal of clarity. We will certainly make sure that everything we do is above board and in keeping with the proper legal and ethical mores that uh, we believe in and we know to be in force. And we're also, also going to ask you for your help. This is not a solo gig. It shouldn't be a solo gig. It hasn't been a solo gig for a long time. So many people support us and help us. And I'm going to ask for your help in this. And I'll tell you more about it in the coming days. But real simple, we believe the current actions and especially the actions over the last two years by Sirius Aircraft to be a clear and present danger to the future of general aviation, certainly to us and certainly to the hundreds of people that they have affected and or harmed and or cheated and or disappointed in so many ways. We're doing our best. We're going to do our best for you. We hope we have your support. You'll see a legal fund uh, set up. You'll see a number of other things come up in the next few days, but know this. We're doing our best. We hope we have your support. We certainly want to hear from you, and more important than anything else, the only way they win is when we quit. I don't quit. For the Aero News Network, Aero TV, and of course Airborne, I'm Jim Campbell on the front lines of a pretty amazing battle. Take care. Finally, today on Airborne, the sky was never this crowded when Sputnik took flight. Now a Russian satellite has been rendered useless by a piece of space debris. 
In 2007, the Chinese government destroyed its Fengyang 1C weather satellite in a missile test. Now, CNN reports that the Russian Blitz satellite, described as a small glass sphere that reflected lasers back to Earth for research purposes, was knocked off its axis by a collision with a piece of the Chinese debris, and it now faces the wrong way, rendering it useless. The collision is thought to have taken place around January 22nd. Researchers from the Center for Space Standards and Innovation told CNN that the only objects cataloged by the U.S. Strategic Command near the Blitz satellite was the debris from the Chinese satellite. It was originally thought that there was sufficient separation between the objects to rule out a collision. Maybe not. CSSI's T.S. Kelso, in a blog posting, writes that it seemed a piece of the Fengyang 1C satellite was the likely culprit. The Chinese satellite had been launched into a polar orbit in 1999. It was destroyed while that government was testing a ground launch medium range ballistic missile creating what U.S. officials said were hundreds of pieces of debris. The test was protested by the U.S., Canada, Australia, and other allies. Well, that's our program for Friday, March 15th. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. Please join us again next Tuesday for another edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.